Welcome back, everyone. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this panel, uh, retired Brigadier General Ken Watkin. Uh, Brigadier General Watkin has had a distinguished military career, and I noticed with, uh, if you can perceive in, inside the bio, the um, that he had involvement as a as a legal officer with some of the operational aspects of Rwanda and post Somalia, which to me is incredibly interesting because it was a very confused time and to be involved with that we're trying to parse out some of the issues that were surrounding those two missions um would be quite intriguing i'm sure if you have a moment to speak to him about that it would be worth your time to inquire I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything so also if you look at uh Brigadier general watkins post military career his his um his involvement with these uh, very difficult issues continues, as well as having a very distinguished teaching and research portfolio. His um, his publications and the teaching proceeds have had are, are exemplary. So on your behalf, I'd like to welcome Brigadier General Walk into our group. Yeah. Good morning. It's uh, it's great to be here. Look, the first two introductory sessions have highlighted uh, international humanitarian law and maritime law and touched on the third body of law, which is, you know, the right to state self-defense or res resort to force. Notice I didn't use Latin. I, I've personally taken the view that Latin's a dead language. Um, it will get me kicked out of the International Lawyers Guild at some point, but in any event, it's uh, the state right to self-defense. So this, these presentations provide an important background for the next panel. IHL, because like Sophie mentioned, it's the failure of some of these other bodies of law to regulate interstate action, which has led to the application of international humanitarian law to try to get back um, to peace. So it's always lurking in the background in these sort of interstate uh, applications. And then there's the maritime body of law, which uh, Phil quite nicely set out, um, complicated area, which in an area which is not only important for global trade, but is just overcome with different territorial claims. There was also mention of another foundational concept, which is that of sovereignty, upon which international order is fundamentally based, but not only in the context of territorial claims, but also questions with respect to protection of nationals, sometime national interests, and increasingly human rights and humanitarian issues, which comes up with humanitarian um, intervention. The dangers facing the international community include a misapplication or misunderstanding of these rules, but it also importantly can include a misunderstanding of the intentions of states that may actually be applying the rules. And just as importantly is increasingly there's a question of how rules are being manipulated by states in something which is quite commonly called gray zone conflict or an a zone which transcends peace and large-scale war. And assessing the application and potential abuse of pre-conflict norms has become critical in contemporary international affairs. One only needs to recall the little green men of 2014, the Russians, which the Russians called the polite people who intervened in Crimea, which led to the seizure of that part of Ukraine. As one Ukrainian counterintelligence officer is reported to have said, we were outgunned in the shadow war just as much as we were on the ground. And so many of these issues are part of the pre-conflict shadow war. With that as a matter of uh, introduction, there's gonna be three speakers on the panel. The first will be Professor Mark Raymond, who's an Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Oklahoma. And he will be discussing what's really going on in the South China Sea, which will be an in interesting counterintuitive part to the presentation presented by uh, Phil Drew. And it's an important topic, obviously, not only the, as was mentioned, not only the uh, harassment just a few days ago of a Philippine Coast Guard vessel and another vessel trying to resupply a garrison on the uh, second Thomas Shoal in the South China Sea, but also the recent harassment of Canadian Armed Forces surveillance plane and Canadian naval participation in freedom of navigation exercises in the area. Then Emma Fingler, who's a PhD candidate, I believe here at Queens, 
And she's going to talk about the complexities of humanitarian intervention and disaster response arising from climate change and the applicability of the responsibility to protect, which interestingly finds its genesis in state right to self-defense and of course was a big part of sort of Canadian interest at the end of the 1990s, that confusing part that uh, Howard mentioned. And so it is now, uh, as Emma will outline, conceptualized perhaps to be used in an entirely different context in uh, going forward. And then finally, we have Lieutenant Commander Brent Lemon, who's a military lawyer and from the Canadian Forces Military Law Center and uh, a naval officer, uh, operational naval officer before you join the, the JAG branch. And he will bring some of the discussion from the lofty strategic heights <laughs> down to the surface level as he discusses Canadian Armed Forces role in operationalizing Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. So first to uh, Professor Raymond, and he's going to be here with us virtually. Um, please uh, let me say thanks for the invitation to join you today and my apologies for not being able to be there in person. Um, I will sort of share screen in a moment and show you some slides that accompany the presentation, uh, but I wanted to sort of say hello in person before I did that. Okay, all right. Uh, it looks like the presentation is visible now, which is excellent. Uh, so the presentation that I'm giving, as the uh, General Watkin mentioned, is called What's Really Going On in the South China Sea? This is the title of an article that I published in 2022 with uh, David Welch uh, at the Balsillie School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo. Uh, he and I co-authored this article in the Journal of Contemporary Southeast Asian Affairs, or current Southeast Asian Affairs, I think. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is about our explanation of what we call China's shifting behavior. And I want to sort of put the two periods in context here. First, the first period is from 2012 to 16, uh, which has been called the sort of unilateralism. We think obstructive engagement is a slightly more accurate term with a little bit lower emotional temperature to it. Uh, but regardless, either way, it's definitely clear that China's behavior in this period, 2012 to 16, differed from its past behavior, and also in ways that we think aren't as well recognized or accounted for in the 2016 to present period. In that period, China, after the arbitral award uh, in which it loses decisively to the Philippines, adopted a posture that's largely what we call stealthy compliance. Uh, they are, in most respects, we think, within the letter of the arbitral award. We do want to flag that Mischief Reef is a clear exception. This is in the Philippines EEZ. Uh, China is clearly not in compliance with the arbitral award in that respect. And we think that's a sort of sore point. We think that's a sort of really interesting and important thing to note. The last point that we want to mention is that stealthy compliance with most elements of the arbitral award does not mean that we think there is the absence of conflict. This is certainly an active set of territorial and maritime jurisdiction disputes. Uh, and we think that that's important to signal up front as well. So we have two key questions here. Uh, first is, why did China's behavior shift, especially after the arbitral award? But we also try and explain the, the 2012 shift as well to a more uh, obstructive pose. And then the second question is, why didn't regional states and other interested states, like Canada and the United States, perceive the shift in Chinese behavior after 2016 more clearly? So those are the two things that we're interested in explaining in the article. Um, we adopt a sort of inductive approach and a sort of multi-factor approach. Um, we think that you can't really get there with any single explanatory factor, which isn't unusual in social science. So we want to sort of run through uh, the main factors that we think explain these various kinds of shifts and then the failure to perceive the shift after 2016. So if we're talking about the adoption of obstructive engagement in and around 2012, we think that there are four factors that are important to note. The first is kind of a two-level game problem. China is trying to balance, on the one hand, domestic legitimacy concerns, uh, which increasingly rest not on ideological grounds, for communism, but more on nationalist grounds. Uh, and the Chinese population largely does believe in a very expansive set of sort of claims in and around South China Sea. And that's a problem because China is seeking to sort of maintain that domestic legitimacy while also obtaining international status. In and around that time, 2010 onward, China and Chinese elites, we think, um, increasingly adopted a loss aversion frame. 
So this is from the political psychology literature that tells us that people, when they perceive a loss frame, are much more risk accepting. So here, China becomes much more risk accepting because its international status was lagging its own perceived entitlement to international status. That's a really important psychological dimension. There's also a bureaucratic politics element. We think that uh, in this time period, it's fairly clear that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs lost influence over this sort of policy file within the Chinese government in favor of PLA, which tends to adopt a more um, obstructive or a more expansive set of claims or a sort of uh, less cooperative policy in general on South China Sea in resolving these disputes. And finally, we think it's important to point out that international rules help explain China's specific choices about how it obstructs and how it engages. So these island building choices are driven by the unclosed provisions that China wants to use in certain ways and wanted to use in certain ways uh, that were ultimately not very successful. So rules are relevant here, but it's really China's lack of skill with them that's especially uh, causally notable. So that's what we think broadly explains the sort of obstructive shift in 2012. So why then, given that sort of policy commitment, did China shift again after only four years to what we call stealthy compliance with most aspects of the arbitral? Here, I want to flag, just for reasons of time, the article sort of goes more fully through this, two, two factors that are especially important. Uh, the MFA used the arbitral award fiasco to wrest control back from PLA. And so after 2016, the policy file for the Chinese government here moves more back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And that bureaucratic politics struggle uh, really kind of is important in understanding the story of what's going on. But also, China, now that the arbitral award is a fact, uh, is seeking to avoid international outlaw status without compromising its domestic legitimacy. So it needs to save face internationally, but it needs to do that in a way that doesn't cause it to lose face domestically. Those are the sort of main constraints, we think, that are helping to explain this Chinese shift to stealthy compliance. So this leaves us with a, a sort of final puzzle in the article, which is to try and explain why sort of interested states in the region and other interested states in the world didn't sort of see that. Why China hasn't been sort of appropriately credited where it deserves at least some credit for pulling back from its worst behavior. Um, and we think really the story is firstly that the stealthy part of China's shift towards compliance was too effective. Nobody noticed. China did too good a job of sort of trying to solve its domestic legitimacy problem here to the extent that it, it didn't sort of visibly uh, get credit for some of the more compliant behavior that it adopted after 2016 compared to the prior, uh, prior four years. And we think there's also a political psychology piece from the rest of the world's perspective, right? Uh, it's not only people in China that, that fall victim to certain kinds of well-documented uh, psychological and cognitive uh, sort of issues. Schema theory suggests that once we form beliefs as humans, we are very resistant to changing them. And the crystallization of the assertive China narrative, especially in government and defense and policy circles in key uh, Western countries, but also key regional states, that crystallized narrative has been very resistant to change. People don't like uh, re-examining these kinds of things very often. It's cognitively difficult and intensive, and it sort of interferes with uh, our desire to create an orderly world. Just to wrap up, I want to talk about some takeaways. Uh, first, we think our analysis shows that threat perception is very difficult to get right. It's for all of these cognitive reasons, for all of the reasons of sort of not having full information about an adversary's or a potential adversary's domestic political conditions and constraints. All of these things make it very difficult for governments all around them, the Chinese government, the regional states, uh, you know, sort of extra regional states uh, like Canada and the United States and others. We all struggle to get threat perception right, and that's a really important thing uh, to do, but a very difficult one. The second point is we think that rules matter a great deal in this case. We think it's important to point out that China has complied with the bulk of an adverse ruling, despite greater material power than the regional state, especially the Philippines, that it opposed in that case, and also its own risk of losing domestic legitimacy from compliance. Second, though, we think that China's lack of skill with international law in this case helps to explain the damage it did to its international relationships and the existence of, of a very adverse arbitral award. We think there might have been a couple of minor points on which if China had engaged more fully, the, the decision may not have been so uh, fully in line with the Philippines case. Finally, 
that continued risk of misperception um, heightens the risk of conflict escalation. We don't think that's a good thing. One sort of question that I don't really have a slide for that I want to sort of address is the pressure on second Thomas Scholl. Uh, we do you know, recognize that even though we think a large amount of the stealthy compliance is still continuing to this day, that pressure is a worrying sign of sort of Chinese bureaucratic politics, because we don't really think that the internationalists, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, those folks um, are really too likely to be in favor of what's going on. So the fact that it is happening, that there are these pressure activities around second Thomas Scholl may suggest that the bureaucratic politics at the Chinese domestic level is tipping back toward PLA. And if that's true, and if that sort of proceeds further in combination with some of these other factors that we uh, examine in our analysis, we think that's a worrisome sign. So there are sort of some signs that this period of stealthy compliance may be drawing to a close, or at least uh, a little bit more under doubt than it has been. I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Looking forward to the other presentations and the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Okay, Emma, you're, uh, you're up next. All right. Yeah, no rush. Um, just an interesting anecdote. Um, David Welch, who was the co-author of that last paper that was being presented, um, was my thesis advisor for the presentation I'm now doing. Um, so very small world. So I think I'll get started. Um, I am a PhD candidate in the political studies department here at Queens. I don't have a background in law. I have a background in policy. And in between um, beginning, well, my master's and my PhD, I worked for three years uh, with the United Nations in Nepal. And while there, I worked on humanitarian uh, coordination activities. So part of this project, looking at it again after presenting it as my uh, major research paper for my thesis, was looking at what have I taken from my experience working from working with the UN and everything that comes from that? So today I'm going to look at the complexities of humanitarian intervention and disaster response using the case of Slaycone Nargis, which took place in 2008 in Myanmar. As disasters become increasingly common in a warming world, ethical, political, and diplomatic questions are raised regarding the boundaries of sovereignty. Particularly, and this is the most important part, in cases where the government fails to respond effectively to a catastrophic event within its own boundaries. So our understanding of response operations and the boundaries as they relate to disasters is lacking. That's, this is the question that I've asked. How can the international community respond when disaster collides with political malfunction, often in the form of corruption, and an unwillingness to respond by the host state? What is the role of international law in this situation? The premise of invoking intervention, but primarily through the use of the responsibility to protect in the case of disaster response is new and controversial. Emerging from poor disaster response operations where many were killed as a result of an ineffective response as opposed to the initial disaster um, has resulted in renewed debate on what intervention can be used for if it's justifiable or legitimate in this circumstance. And intervention itself, R2P itself, is a long and oft debated subject, controversial in a number of ways. So I use the case of Myanmar as a way to see, well, what happened in this situation and what type of questions still remain. So I've broken it down into three sections of an argument. And really, each aspect of this argument is a way to look at this case further. So first, analyzing the intersection of disaster response and humanitarian intervention is a necessary component of international law. The issue will become increasingly relevant in the face of climate change and an unwillingness of the international community to come to a decision or even debate this topic will result in additional and unnecessary harm. The case of Myanmar, which I'm going to get into in this presentation, serves as a warning 
for how humanitarian intervention and disaster response will continue to overlap in the future, particularly as climate change affects the severity and frequency of catastrophic storms, um, events like annual flooding that occurs perhaps once every 20 years, when we're talking about severity, is something that is going to happen much more frequently and something that we no longer have the capacity to deal with from an international or a national perspective. And of course, this is something that is extremely relevant to Canada as well. Um, my other research looks at, well, what's Canada's role internationally and nationally when we talk about disaster response? So to begin, I wanted just a bit of a primer on, well, where does disaster response stand under international law? How can we actually understand this concept? Um, the role of international law in disaster governance remains quite limited. International disaster response law created by the IFRC has developed guidelines that countries are proposed to use, um, particularly when responding to disasters. And the majority of these guidelines stipulate laws that alleviate issues that would commonly occur in the aftermath, such as the authorization to import and use humanitarian relief items, non-relief items, and equipment as one of the bylines there. But it does remain unusual in disaster governments for agreements or policies of any kind to be legally binding. And this is particular at the regional and international levels. We have major international agreements on humanitarian assistance and uh, disaster relief, such as the Grand Bargain, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and these, of course, remain voluntary. But legal scholars explain this by noting that soft law in the form of guidelines and recommendations are positively impacting the prospect of international law of disasters. So as you can see here, Disaster researchers look at disaster as a continuous life cycle, as something that we are always dealing with and always having to think about in the back of our mind. If we think about disasters as cyclical, this is how we would look at each stage of it and knowing that, well, that strategic preparedness aspect of it is constantly occurring, even in the aftermath of a disaster. While you may be doing a short-term response, you're preparing for the long-term repercussions of whatever is happening in that time. So if we switch to, well, the responsibility to protect, of course, the controversial nature of it and um, a varied history of intervention. Since it was indoctrinated at the international law level at the 2005 World Summit, it's remained provocative and, as I said, off debated. Um, much like the, the ongoing concept of intervention, there are two sides to this debate, in particular, if we're going to simplify this to the nth degree. Those who view R2P as an international norm established to protect citizens and necessary in the face of atrocities, and those who see it as a violation of sovereignty and a continuation of patterns of colonization and imperialism. One of the defining co components of the responsibility to protect is that of the four crimes outlined by this, particularly genocide, it can never be accidental and must be carried out at the explicit or tactic direction of a state, authorities, or those who claim authorities. This is where the concept of disasters comes into play and makes it a difficult subject to study in this context. While disasters are initially natural occurrences, the aftermath depends strictly on the effectiveness of response activities. However, choosing not to provide aid can be seen as negligence and constitute explicit direction by state authorities on the loss of life, but by not acting, international law does not see this as an action unto itself. So when we have that in mind and we're talking about R2P, there's a constant debate between, well, what is an action undertaken by the state and how does that constitute a crime against humanity or one of the other four pillars under R2P? I'm not sure how I managed to. <laughs> okay. 
All right. So the nexus of humanitarian intervention and disasters is where most of my interests lie in this debate. Disasters aren't without baggage, of course. They're accompanied by historical grievances, including failing infrastructure due to corruption and racism, ongoing discrimination against vulnerable groups like women and minorities, and inequitable distribution of resources all affect how we respond to a disaster and how effective that response is. It also includes who we are inviting to respond to that disaster, whether or not we agree that international organizations should be involved, other states should be involved, non-governmental organizations, the list goes on. So I propose analyzing disaster response activities as they specifically relate to negligence. This is where the argument comes in where we can say by not acting is a form of negligence, as opposed to under R2P, you would need to act for any of those categories to count. So R2P is determined to be unapplicable due to contextual factors and the risks of ensuing conflict. Then the next consideration is determining whether or not a state has con committed negligence resulting in undue harm. Incapability, like I said, is different from a failure to respond. It rests on a state's choice to refuse to help or resist. A state is culpable of negligence based on responsibility for the creation of risk that is abnormal. And that part there is key. By not acting, they are impacting the lives of those in the aftermath of disaster negatively to a degree that it affects their life and livelihood. It remains possible under international law to determine if a state is negligent in its care of its population and can then be held responsible for those actions. In the aftermath of disasters, organizations that are part of the response retain both authority and legitimacy within this realm and restricting their access can cause undue harm. And of course, sovereignty, the key factor when discussing intervention of any kind. We need to look at if to infringe on sovereignty, which is generally only undertaken in the context of war, requires there to be considerable amounts of harm, arguably greater than the risk of intervention itself. So we're well, going to look at this specifically in the case of Cyclone Nargis. From May 2nd to 3rd, 2008, Cyclone Nargis struck Myanmar's south central region of the Irrawaddy Delta, devastating the region. It was a catastrophic Category 4 storm and displaced 2.4 million people, while 140,000 people were killed or presumed dead. The severity of the storm was accentuated by a storm surge, which is often not predicted in these types of low-lying communities, um, and as a result of deforestation of a coastal mangrove in this region made it particularly deadly. What makes this important is that disasters are going to happen. We know that. But the devastation of this disaster was accentuated by widespread disease and starvation in its aftermath. This was because of a refusal to accept assistance. Immediate concern was food shortages, but the government refused access to aid workers and journalists, blocking the areas most severely affected, arguing that it would prefer to allocate resources through the natural government national government without international support. So rather than accepting international assistance, which is recognized as a norm or common practice in the field, the government closed the borders and blocked access to the region for those already in the country. And that's an important distinction here because as Sophie mentioned in her presentation, often you already have organizations working in country in terms of preparedness and resilience and all these types of activities by blocking not only international access, but internal access as well. They took that opportunity to cause harm. The UN made a statement as early as May 7th, requesting access to the region. And while the junta allowed a select few in during this period, it wasn't enough to make an impact and there were massive um, amounts of corruption as well. France believed the government had for the government of Myanmar had forfeited its right to non-intervention when they didn't allow others to assist their population, nor did the assisting themselves. This is when the notion of R2P came up, um, which was particularly difficult from a former colonizing power in the region. China and Russia argued that because the acts were not systematic, it could not be included under R2P. 
and there was a strong concern about precedent, which South Africa and Indonesia argued against. So ultimately it remained clear, thank you, that the UN and that R2P was not applicable in this situation. However, what's the alternative when this comes to? And this is where we need additional research. This is where we need to understand, well, what's the possibility of that nexus? How is this going to continue to become an issue in international law, within our international communities, and within agreements that we make? So the first is increased exception and eventual internalization of state responsibility to respond and the international community's contributions in the aftermath. It's considered something that is quite common, but we need to move to the next stage of this is a norm and humanitarian government governance is understood across regional organizations as well as international. The continued involvement of regional organizations to place pressure on states. That's another one. Um, this actually ended up being a key part of the response for Cyclone Nargis when ASEAN stepped in and said, we need to be involved here. We need to put pressure on the states. And it will come down to what does the least amount of harm. By refusing to discuss this topic or confront the possibility, the international community is committing itself to further harm. What are the ethical considerations of not having this discussion? How do we balance ethical considerations, legality, and sovereignty? What happens when this type of event occurs again? And how many lives will be lost or irre irrevocably changed before we have this conversation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Brent, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, like Colonel said, my name is Brent, and uh, I am very appreciative of the opportunity to interact with everybody here today. Um, I want to get two quick things off my chest. So one, I'm here in uniform. I'm a member of the Military Law Center, uh, but please don't make the mistake uh, and conclude that I'm speaking on behalf of the Canadian Armed Forces or the Government of Canada. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of Brent, and that is a much lower authority than either of those two institutions. Um, secondly, I am undoubtedly the academic lightweight of this panel. Um, but hopefully my presentation will inspire some questions today and, uh, and some future conversations as well. I think the topic is super relevant um, and very timely. I just spent some time early this year with the US Army and I can tell you their JAG Corps is hyper-focused on this region of the world. Uh, and in fact, the US Army has incorporated law of the sea into their doctrine for the very first time in history, I understand, primarily because of their focus on the Asia Pacific uh, and its increased relevance. So, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about Canada and, and specifically the Canadian Armed Forces security contributions to this region of the world. And where do I think we should start? Well, Government of Canada recently released an Indo-Pacific strategy. And this is where I submit to you, we need to start thinking about um, when we think about CAF contributions to security in the area. So let's see what the, the strategy has to say. The, uh, it's a short document. It's only 23 pages long. In fact, it's only 21 pages if you get rid of the title page and the uh, publishing information. And it was published last November, November of 2022. Uh, early in the pages, the strategy asserts that the rising influence of the Indo-Pacific region is a once in a generation global shift that requires a generational Canadian response. And then the strategy establishes five interconnected strategic objectives in order to um, operationalize that response. And here they are, if I can make this work. These are broad ranging objectives, right? They're short sentences. They use, um, I won't say vague, but certainly broad language. Um, and the federal government has made it very clear that this is meant to be a broad strategy. It's described it as a comprehensive roadmap to deepen our engagement in the region, uh, and also described it as a whole of society uh, strategy. So this is meant to be a very broad, broad strategy, despite the fact it's only 21 pages long. Uh, here are some fun facts, some very simplistic uh, quantitative analysis when I went through the document. The words security and secure appear 76 times in those 21 pages. 
Um, but the words economy and economic appear 86 times. So this is hardly uh, merely a security focused document. The word security shows up in objective number one, but there are four more objectives um, and, and this is not just a security document. I'd also suggest this is not just uh, a China strategy either. Uh, even in the narrow realm of security, Canada certainly has issues with other actors in the region, uh, notably India. So it's not just a China strategy. Um, but if we continue on with some simplistic quantitative analysis, um, the word China appears 51 times in the document. Again, this is only a 21 page document. Um, meanwhile, uh, states like Vietnam, Singapore, and the Philippines appear three times, and mighty Malaysia appears but once. So. I suggest to you the strategy is uh, aligned to the, the regional realities. Um, and there's some pretty language in the strategy concerning China. So if you look at the, you know, you shift sort of a qualitative analysis, there's, there's some statements in there that uh, I would never suggest they're on Canadian, but I think they show a shift in Canada's position. Here, here are some of the quotations that struck me as, as relevant. Um, the strategy notes that China's rise was enabled by the same international rules and norms that it now increasingly disregards such as its disregard for UN rulings on disputes in the South China Sea, specifically that 2016 ruling, um, and its actions to further militarize that region and challenge navigation and overflight rights. The strategy also states that Canada will challenge China when it engages in coercive behavior, whether that's economic or otherwise, when it ignores human rights um, obligations or undermines our national security interests and those interests of our partners in the region. Both the Minister of National Defense and the Minister of Foreign Affairs have repeated a reframe of uh, challenge when we ought to and cooperate when we must or when we can. So um, these statements are being publicly repeated um, out in the political sphere. So that's a, a high level look at this strategy. And I think what I would submit to you is regardless of what you think of the strategy, and I encourage you to go read it, it's not a long read. Um, I would submit to you that anything about the CAF contributions to security have to begin with the strategy. This government has published um, this strategy. It does not publish a publicly available strategy uh, for every region of the world. And when the CAF or other departments start planning what to do, uh, their plans will nest into this higher government strategy. So let's take a look at um, Canada's security presence in the Indo-Pacific. We have had a presence in the Indo-Pacific prior to 2022. Like prior to this strategy, certainly we were there in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the CAF has run operations NEON and projection in the Indo-Pacific going back several years. Um, and as an aside on naming of operations, the naming of CAF operations is somewhat murky, but here's another fun fact for you. If you pay attention, some observers have noted that the first letter of a named operation often points to the geographic region or perhaps the actor we're trying to influence in that region. So if you look at some of the Afghanistan operations like Apollo and Athena, you can see that. Uh, and, uh, and if you listen to some of the operations I name, you can try and play that game as we go through the rest of my presentation. So, um, Operation Projection is, uh, according to the government site, is Canada's ongoing naval forward presence mission to promote peace and stability in support of the rules-based international order in the Pacific. Operation Neon, however, is more specific. It is Canada's mission to enforce UN Security Council resolutions, um, pressuring North Korea to cease its weapons of mass destruction testing, its ballistic missile testing, and uh, nuclear weapon testing. So we've had those two things happening in the Indo-Pacific for a little while now. Uh, and we we're partnered with other nations in doing this, Australia, the US, the UK, some of the usual ones, as well as regional partners. And right now, the uh, warship Vancouver and some of our maritime patrol aircraft are in the Indo-Pacific right now enforcing Operation Neon. Um, but the Minister of National Defense recently announced a new operation for this region just this past June, Operation Horizon, she called it. And this comes with an enhanced military presence in the region. And specifically, she's committed a third warship to deploy to the region annually going forward. You said two, one for projection, one for neon. We're now adding a third, uh, a third warship. And I suggest this is noteworthy because one of those warships is going to come from the Atlantic fleet. And if you pay attention to naval history in this, in this country, at least recent history, the Atlantic fleet has been the more important fleet. Usually the bigger fleet, certainly the more important fleet deriving from our NATO obligations and from the simple fact there are more Russian submarines to hunt in the Atlantic than in the Pacific. But now we're picking up a ship from the Atlantic fleet, historically more important, and we're dropping it into the Pacific. Um, that may be evidence of this generational shift that the government is talking about in that, in that strategic document. Um, and in August of this year, the Ottawa and our supply ship Asterix deployed uh, from Victoria to complete that three warship um, deployment to, uh, to the Indo-Pacific. 
And so three warships. Is that, a, is that a lot of warships? Is that a lot of is that a big commitment? Um, certainly, the U.S. Navy has far more warships operating in the region than we do. But um, those three warships, those three frigates, are a quarter of our 12 frigate fleet. So, um, and we have a fourth warship deploying on Operation Reassurance. Uh, and so now you have um, four warships deploying annually. Uh, each is about 250 odd folks on board. So we have a thousand uh, folks deploying annually. And the Navy, the Regular Force Navy in Canada, about 8,000 people strong. Right. So to keep those numbers in mind, that will give you an idea of the relative uh, size of these uh, of these commitments. Um, some stuff in the news. So. I like pictures. Not very good technology. Maybe Brian can help me out. Yay. There's the former Minister of National Defense. Uh, and on June the 3rd, she announced Operation Horizon. Uh, with that third frigate um, going to the Pacific and uh, specifically said that our ships will sail in the South and East China Seas and through the Taiwan Strait in full accordance with international law. On that same day, Montreal sailed through the Taiwan Strait. Hands up who thinks that was a coincidence. Nobody's hand is up. But yeah, absolutely not a coincidence, right? Uh, we sailed through the Strait with a U.S. warship. Uh, and on that day, a Chinese warship sailed right in front of the U.S. ship, which was ahead, uh, nearly caused a collision, but certainly indicating the Chinese government's displeasure with uh, sailing warships through uh, the Taiwan Strait. Some other things. We weren't done. This happened just last month. The Ottawa sailed through the Taiwan Strait. Uh, we had a news team on board. You may have seen some of the CBC coverage because the CBC was on board. There's the Ottawa in the Philippines, Canada sharing technology. Uh, there's a picture from that, uh, that incident that uh, Professor Drew, Drew uh, spoke about. This was just a couple weeks ago on the 16th of October. Uh, our maritime patrol aircraft was enforcing Operation Neon and Chinese fighter jets came out to intercept and conducted what was later called unsafe maneuvers, including launching flares in front of our, our maritime patrol aircraft. Uh, again, that patrol aircraft is enforcing UNSCR uh, rules. Do not want that slide yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's noteworthy that we've got some news uh, folks on board some of our platforms. And that may be, uh, this is just me speculating, that may be an attempt to, to make these stories um, more public and to display what, what Canada feels to be unsafe uh, or unlawful activity. We also have legal officers um, deployed. So we have one legal officer deployed with those ships. Um, and so they are out there uh, commenting and, and advising on things like IHL or maritime law, law uh, as well as aspects of, of international law. So this is not just um, ships with missiles. You know, we have public affairs officers on board. We have legal officers advising on, on, uh, on these operations. OK. Some things that the government has said in terms of this new op horizon, which we don't know a whole lot about yet, um, these are some things that we do know. They have committed a bunch of money for that third warship, over $300 million worth annually. Um, there's committed uh, more money for more exercises uh, and, uh, and bilateral um, work with partners in the region. Some more money. I think this last one's interesting, like cyber initiatives, right? And so they printed a bunch of money for cyber, uh, 2.6 billion, which is not a lot of money. I don't think uh, it's gonna come to D&D for that, but I think they, uh, the cyber stuff is gonna be increasingly relevant. And of course, it doesn't have to be done from the theater. That can be done from here in Canada. Okay, let me leave that there. I think though that there's some challenges. So I think there's some ambitious goals. I think we've got lots of pieces in place, but there's some challenges that I don't think the CAF uh, can ignore. And so I'll offer three, um, but there's certainly there are more than three. The first one I would mention is resources. People and money and their scarcity are always going to matter, right? Canadian Armed Forces is short, depends how you do the math, depends who you listen to, but like short thousands of people from our authorized strength, maybe as many as 8,000 people short uh, and not a huge organization. Uh, the federal government also announced that it wanted to find a billion dollars worth of money from the current defense budget. And so money and people are in short supply. The CAF has also got commitments in other areas of the world, right? Um, the prime minister recently announced earlier this year that Canada would change 
uh, its battle group commitment to a brigade level commitment in Latvia. And what that means uh, is we're going to go from 1,000 to, thanks, sir, to 2,000 people. Um, again, a lot of people. Another challenge in the Indo Pacific is simply the size. It is a big region. Like the Pacific is big. I mean, Pearl Harbor is useful at American base in the middle of Pacific in Hawaii, but it's a big chunk of water. Like Victoria, BC, a wonderful town, thousands of kilometers to the west of here. Victoria, BC is closer to Moscow than it is to Beijing. Pacific is a big, hard logistical space to, to operate in. And I think the last challenge I would offer is that um, Canada's hoping to partner with nations in the Indo-Pacific, but many of these nations would be new partners to Canada. In Europe, we've got longstanding historical ties, institutional ties like NATO that facilitate these partnerships. Uh, don't have those advantages in the Indo-Pacific yet. But the word partner shows up 111 times in that strategic document. So um, maybe that's my last fun fact on, on, on word counting. But there's no doubt Canada is going to want to partner. But I suggest that we're going to have to earn those partnerships um, going forward. So I think with that, I'm done. Thanks, sir. Okay, hey, that's a, a rare occurrence. All the panelists got done well, with, well within their time of the 15 minutes allotted. I was I, I mentioned in an email I mentioned to the panelists that I was at a, a conference in Moscow a few years ago, and the moderator actually had a bell that they rang in, at the end of the 15 minutes. I was always afraid they were going to cut the power as well. Um, the moderator also had a shot of vodka for each of the panelists at the end of the panel. Unfortunately, I don't have any today, and hopefully the panelists won't need it after all your questions. Anyways, okay, so we're going to open up now for questions. Are there any questions from, from the floor? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three of you. It was really, really interesting uh, to hear your perspectives. Uh, my question is mainly for, for Brent. Um, you mentioned through Operation Horizon that a third warship was heading to the region. I'm wondering what else we might expect to see as things progress uh, from the Canadian Armed Forces in, in terms of security contributions in, in that region. Yeah, I think sailing like a warship through the state of Taiwan is a... Uh... A tremendous debate for the support of a, of a rules-based order, but but there are lots of other things that that I think the Canadian Forces is doing. Um, you know, we have exchanges that are happening. Uh, Canadian General is going to become the deputy commander uh, for the UN mission in, in Korea uh, later on this year. Um, we're participating in conferences, uh, whether it's the U.S. Indo PACOMS uh, Mill Ops Conference. Uh, there was a NATO conference that Chris Drew attended not so long ago in, in Victoria, looking at the Indo Pacific. Um, you know, and just a kind of a, a sort of random, but but uh, military law center example. Uh, one of the things that our organization is charged with is is the training of IHL for the Canadian Armed Forces, and we do that ten or more times across uh, the country a year. But we also go outside of Canada to do that training. Uh, earlier this year, we were in Kenya uh, and Latvia, and next year we're going to Malaysia to to do IHL training with their armed forces. So, um, yeah, I think warships are. Are tremendously powerful, but there's there's a wide spectrum of, of options. Thank you. Okay, another question. Hi, Emma. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation just on the uh, situation in Myanmar, Myanmar and R two P. Um. It made me think of a situation that's a little closer to home, and in particular, I think of the earthquake in Haiti and the fact that we're still seeing the ramifications from that. Um, do you have a position on, uh, I know that you are, you, you had spoken in favor of using R2P as an option for providing aid. Do you have a position though on um, the notion of trusteeship when uh, you're into a situation where you've got a humanitarian disaster and a government that cannot and and or will not react, or the government has become complete completely dysfunctional. Yeah, I think that's a great question and a controversial one as well in the field. Um, I think if I'm looking at this from a personal perspective and just if we look at Haiti as an example, 
The role of colonialism in Haiti's history is so overwhelming in how their day-to-day governance works or doesn't work. Um, Everything that we've seen through that perspective of the history of Haiti has led to this point of just nothing really working. And I think Haiti is an interesting conversation because one of the interventions that the UN went in um, to help with ended up leading to an outbreak of cholera in the country itself and worsened everything that happened there. I think the only way to move forward, and this kind of goes back to, again, Sophie's presentation on how far are we willing to push countries and what are the long-term implications of that? So when we go in, I think it should be done in form of partnership as a way to say, we are here for the long term to help you, to help your citizens, um, regardless of ethnicity of certain groups or all types of different issues that might come up, um, which it did in Myanmar in particular. I would be very hesitant to say trusteeship is a good option for disaster response, just because the long-term implications of that mean we might not be there to help for another disaster because there's a lack of trust. Okay, and uh, Mark, I had a I had a question for you, if I can take the floor as the moderator. And and that relates to uh, uh, quite fascinating your, your view of sort of the internal bureaucratic battle within uh, the PLA and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and that does raise the questions you raised at the end there, the degree to which um, the PLA may be resur- uh, on resurgence in terms of their ability to influence what's going on in the South China Sea. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts about what role international law has to play in this, or is it truly a bureaucratic internal issue to China? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you thank- for the question. I'm kind of getting some audio breaking up, so I apologize if it's not smooth. But um, in terms of the role for international law, I think it's it's a complicated question, right? Because one sort of consideration is whether other states in the region will choose the same course of action that the Philippines did and initiate arbitral proceedings uh, against China. And I think that is an option to use international law as a tool here. It needs to be carefully considered, I think, in light of not only those regional states' capabilities in terms of their interests, the nature of the disputes, but I also think it has to be calibrated in terms of sort of trying not to inadvertently worsen the situation with China. Um, one worry that we have that we talk a little bit about in the paper is that if the sort of aggressive China narrative remains crystallized within Western countries and within regional states as a sort of view of China overall, uh, we think that could risk provoking um, exactly that kind of reaction in China. So for example, if the Chinese MFA is not able to demonstrate back to central leadership, to President Xi, uh, any kind of progress as a result of having some control over the file domestically, that may strengthen the PLA hand, especially if Western states continue to aggressively pursue phone ops and other kinds of uh, options that that Brent was talking about. And so while on the one hand, I recognize the meaning and the significance of those is intended to uphold international law, if it's not paired with a diplomatic outreach strategy that sort of tries to make clear to China um, that there is some recognition of its positive moves alongside criticism of its negative moves, then we think that can over time uh, worsen rather than ameliorate the, the, the situation. So I think it's a complicated question. Uh, it's not an easy one. And I think that this is where for me as a political science uh, scientist and international relations scholar, I think that a purely legal view of international law is sometimes too narrow and unhelpful because it doesn't recognize fully that International law is a tool that states use. They innovate, they push the envelope, they present certain interpretations of international law that are sometimes principled and sometimes less so. And all of these things are true. It's a political thing. And I think bifurcating international law from international politics and international relations runs risks of those kinds. So I guess that would be my my answer to the question. I think it is an important tool, but it has to be seen in a fuller perspective. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Um, another question, Joel? Yes, uh, thank you so much for these phenomenal talks. Um, my question is related to R2P. Um, a two-part question, if that's all right. <clears throat> First part, 
if you don't see trusteeship as a great option moving forward, um, how does R2P grow in legitimacy in this area? What sort of structural protections are needed to avoid overstep? Um, and as you mentioned, potential modern forms of colonization. Um, and then sort of secondary to that, do you see the disaster intervention as possibly uh, an easier path into um, legitimizing the norm than uh, situations of war? Um, I just thought of that randomly. I'm not sure I'll let you speak to that. And then question number two, uh, you spoke about using genocide uh, to get sort of get in the door with R2P related to disaster intervention, if I understood correctly. You talked about acts, uh, need of an act, if negligence could be considered a lack of an act, thus sort of constituting one. Um, but what about in that situation of a cyclone, a group, like a specific group on an enumerated ground in, uh, in Myanmar and um, how you would define that in a situation of such a broad catastrophe? Uh, sorry for those lengthy questions. I hope you were able to get what you needed. No, that's great. Thank you. So I think I'll, I'll just do it in order of the questions that you gave. I think in terms of how do we grow R2P's legitimacy, if we're looking at it from this perspective, I think we need to look at it more of a norm and something that perhaps can be further integrated into regional organizations than at the international level. Regional organizations are much more likely to have states that agree on certain cultural aspects or normative aspects. And so if you think of something like ASEAN, there's a general norm of non-interference within ASEAN, which has made the case of Myanmar currently extremely difficult. But in the case of Cyclone Nargis, it actually was Myanmar who put the pressure on, uh, it was ASEAN who put the pressure on Myanmar in order to say it's been, I think it ended up being over 20 days before they were able to to intervene, but the pressure there behind the scenes, the diplomatic pressure, I think is going to be the way to go with R2P in terms of making this, we make it more legitimate through those closed doors, behind the scenes meetings, this notion of soft law. I think using R2P as a form of military intervention is always going to have a very difficult time gaining legitimacy. And I don't necessarily think it is a good option in the vast, vast majority of cases, just based on our general history of its use or the use of intervention more generally. In terms of disaster um, intervention, I don't think it will help to legitimize it as a norm because you're expanding the scope of R2P beyond the initial boundaries and states will be more likely to put their hackles up at the expansion of a norm that's perhaps already so controversial it won't be invoked. Um, so I think this notion of disaster intervention, really there's a need to have this debate and to have these kinds of discussions. And I think they're more likely to happen at the regional than the international level, just because of the way states work. Um, so in, in that sense, I think it's a conversation that needs to happen, but I don't necessarily think it will help in legitimizing it as a norm. In terms of the like two and a half question, <laughs> um, in terms of specific groups and how you would define if a state is not acting in that regard. Oftentimes in states, um, specific ethnic groups are in very specific regions. And you see this with what's happening in the Rakhine state in Myanmar right now. Um, it's very, very difficult to kind of define, well, this region has this specific group because when we're talking about disasters, we need to also talk about who's your most vulnerable community within that area. And we break that down through an intersectional lens. So we're not only looking at ethnicity, we're also looking at gender, class, um, rural versus urban, whichever lens we're looking at that from, it's going to determine how we see that specific group, which makes it more difficult to look at these types of issues under something like the Rome statute, um, under something like the pillars of our two and how we understand the legality of this mixed in with the infrequency of disasters and the unpredictable nature of them. And we have time for one more question. 
Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all three of you. Uh, that was really insightful for presentations. I had more of a vague overarching question, though, just for anyone who's wanting to answer. How does, as if so, uh, does the private sector and multinational corporations impact your respective disciplines and research areas? Um, it's obviously, obviously going, going to be within, within the study of international law and law development. And, and I'm just I'm curious if you have a step back, step back um, um, and what you've been studying for or else forward to the um, um, universities of a uh, stronger private sector or in our corporations. And then also, I think that there's better and stronger interventions on a lot scale as well. Anyone want to follow and take that on? Take that on. Mark, Mark, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I can try. So the, the audio was a bit difficult again. Again. Uh, but in, in terms of the question, I understood the thrust to be about the role of the private sector. Um, most of my research is actually in cybersecurity governance and policy uh, rather than, than this piece uh, with David. Uh, so in, in terms of that, it's the role of the private sector is enormously important. Microsoft, for example, uh, has made a number of very interesting and innovative proposals around international law in the cyber domain. Uh, they also um, have an office of UN affairs and are seeking to be involved in UN discussions that are sort of both diplomatic and, and potentially international legal in character. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of involvement there. I think it's an increasingly complex uh, situation. Uh, I've just had an article come out in the journal Contemporary Security Policy on what a colleague and I call authoritarian multilateralism, cyber governance, uh, and, and we see some elements of, of private sector involvement there. So if you're interested in that article, uh, it was just out on Sunday, again, in the journal Contemporary Security Policy. So if you're interested, you can check out that. Uh, thanks again for the question and for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, I hope it's been uh, of interest and use for all of you there. Thanks. of um, the ongoing privatization and the influence of international corporations or agencies. In terms of disasters, there's a risk of further monetizing disasters that I think is not the right path to go down um, beyond where it is now even. There is a continued risk, and we see this with development, right, of, well, we'll help you build this road in exchange, we want a vote or we want a certain amount of cooperation on a future international policy we're proposing or that type of cooperation. So I think there's this risk of bringing in too much of an aspect of capitalism in terms of disasters in, in my part of it. And a key part of disaster response is context. And that's always an issue we have with response operations. We bring people in on an ad hoc basis. They don't understand the context of what's actually happening. And that results in further long-term repercussions that are negative for the state. That's really quickly. I think, um, you know, the context of security contributions, I mean, the private sector is increasingly relevant. I mean, when I'm talking about IHL and rules that apply to contractors, other folks who are not part of an armed force in an area, or the example of uh, the Navy leasing a ship, right? So one of the three ships in the Pacific right now is was not purpose-built as a ship for our Navy. It was actually leased to bridge the gap between our replenishment ships, you know, being retired and the new ones coming online. So um, in that particular case, I think the question is, what is this thing, right? Is this is this part of Canada's Navy? Like, if 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 something happened, and and Professor Drew talked about the, the important character of ships and what that means from a legal point of view and from a political point of view, uh, certainly the private sector is increasingly relevant. I think clarity on some of these issues uh, is important. I think that's where the law can help. Just again, um, really emphasize the. Uh, the issue of uh, miscalculation in all of this, and the uh, and the key issue of being one of open and honest conversations in terms and limit and a true assessment of what international law can do and what it can't do um, in terms of states dealing with one another. Um, there's there's a lot of room for miscalculation, and there's there's also though a growing trend of concern of states are using other states' compliance with international law as a means to take advantage that ultimately can lead to armed conflict. So it's a, it's a fraught area in which to be, uh, in which to be dealing with. Uh, you folks in particular will find out, I guess, as you, as you graduate, anyways.
I would be remiss if I didn't point out that there is an evaluation available off the conference and it would be appreciated by all, all of us organizers if you could take a moment and visit the site. I know there's probably survey fatigue in the room, but it would be great for helping us shape future activities like this if you could just take a few moments to do the survey. I'll give everybody a second to take the photo. Okay, I'm, I, I normally look for a pilot in the room at this point to see if he's still fumbling with his phone and I think we're good. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Lieutenant Commander Lemon and uh, Dr. Rondeau to come forward and give us a, a few closing remarks. I think just very briefly, I would say um, I'm a bit biased, but I like the law. I think the law can do a lot of good. Um, and so I think you know international law in the Asia Pacific is, is a great topic. The Asia Pacific is super relevant, um, only getting more relevant. Um, and so those are two great things about this topic. I think the last thing I would say um, before I hand it over to Dr. Rondo is, is a point that Michael brought up this morning, which is the, the diversity of the people in this room to talk about those two things, the law and the, and the Asia Pacific region. We've got academics, we've got, of course, Red Cross people, uh, we've got some people in uniform. And I think those different perspectives uh, they've experienced different things, um, they have different thoughts, and to have that exchange, I think, is, is tremendously powerful. I know certainly in KM Forces, we appreciate that opportunity uh, to hear from everyone, to learn from everyone, and, uh, and to be a part of that. So uh, I know there's a reception afterwards, so I'd be certainly happy to chat with anybody and, and look forward to hearing from folks at that reception. And with that, I will hand it over to you. For Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Brent. Uh, before I give the thank yous to everybody that was involved in this event, I would like to invite all of you to join us in the coffee area uh, later for a little reception. Uh, you can be rewarded with food and beverages and joining us into a networking event. So I hope you can uh, you can join us for the students are here. If there's any food remaining, you can share that with your community and the collectivity. We don't like it to go to waste. Uh, so first, I want to thank Queen's University for hosting the event and our three partners on the planning committee. Having multiple partners is, is our way of walking the talk. We talk about community, you know, community and building capacity. That's how you do it. You reach out to the various stakeholders in the community and you ask what kind of subject you want to want, who would you like to hear on the panel? And this is, uh, for me, a successful result of the kind of work we're trying to do with IHL dissemination. Uh, we want to thank uh, Queen's Law that was represented by Dr. Philip Drew. Thank you also for being on the panel. We really appreciate it. I've learned a lot during that presentation. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank the Canadian Forces Military Law College that was represented by Lieutenant Colonel Eric Weaver and also Lieutenant Commander Brent Lemon. Thank you very much for the partnership and also for the participation wearing the two hats for this event was a, a keen testament of your commitment to dissemination of IHL. We want to thank the Center for International and Defense Policy, represented by Professor Stephanie Martel, Dr. Howard Coombs, who was also our magnificent MC. Thank you very much for standing in. A special thank you to Maureen Bartram and Brian Hootman, who did much of the logistics and the communication support. We could not have done it without you. So a kind thank you. And for us, this is also part of building that community, is setting up events and working together. So thank you very, very much. One last word, very important to me. I want to talk, uh, thank uh, Michael Stephen, a member of my team who was the lead on that event. Uh, a very heartfelt thank you. It's always nice. We work really hard, so we don't get to work together on many projects. And this is something that we enjoy doing. And it's a, it's a really, uh, we're very grateful to have you all in the room to actually discuss and be engaged on those subjects. That's what makes our work uh, meaningful. And Michael, without you, that could have not have happened. So thank you very, very much. Um, I also want to thank our panelists, uh, Mark Raymond that joined us online, Emma Fingler, and uh, 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 of course, Brigadier General Ken Watkins that gave us the privilege of hearing your, your comments on the panel. I'm always in awe of hearing how you can package this together. Now we can see it, the link with IHL was not as obvious in other contexts. So we were very happy that you were here bringing your knowledge and uh, your presence to here. Thank you very much for being with us. We want to thank our two interns. So some people are asking, what can we do uh, to do IHL? We have internship. We have uh, Joseph Varga in the back, that's our current intern, and uh, Oliver Zhao, who was our summer intern that 
help us uh, do this, this event. It's important also to thank the service staff because we are meeting in person. So there are people that are going to help with the food that's available in a few moments and are going to clean the room afterwards. So this is very important to notice that without those people, we cannot actually uh, meet. Uh, I want to thank you, all of the participants. If it was just us talking into a room, that would be like a working session and it would not have a lot of impact. I want to especially thank the high school students and the teacher with us. They are from École Secondaire Catholique at St. Mary River. That's really impressive that at this kind of event, we have high school students. So thank you very much for joining us on this morning. Uh, all of you that participated and that registered, your knowledge, your action, your research, your future career, but also what you're doing right now. It's not just in the future, your current involvement, your advocacy that you will do. All of that will serve for the application of international law in a way that it preserves a more peaceful order, that protects humanity, that protects the environment on the long term. So thank you very much to be part of uh, this effort. And without further ado, I invite you to join us for, uh, for uh, a, a reception afterwards. Thank you very much and have a good day.